Welcome to SAS Bites. This is your weekly bite of SAS during your lunch break. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Micah Godbolt, and with us as usual, Elise Holiday. Awesome Hi. to have you on the show today. It's not lunchtime, though. It's not quite. Well, it's lunchtime for me, maybe not for you, but that's how it goes on this show. Um, sometimes it's lunchtime for people over in Europe, for all we know. So um, anyway, this is uh, we're continuing on our series of uh, front-end architecture this week. Uh, we've got an awesome guest on, and as I kind of said last week, um, we're trying to bring on different guests that have different specializations uh, over these these different areas in front-end architecture. Um, you know, not not everyone focuses on just one pillar. Some really kind of focus and hone in on um, you know on just testing, or really on the code and code standards, or in this case, documentation and code. So um, we're really excited to have uh, Gina Bolton on the show. Uh, Gina, thanks for coming by. I appreciate you fighting bridges and um, <laughs> and boats to get here, uh, finding your headphones and everything it takes to get on. So welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so Gina is the senior product designer uh, of design systems at Salesforce UX. So you know Salesforce, you might have heard of them. They're kind of a big deal. Um, she's also the lead um, on uh, Team SaaS Design. Uh, so if you've ever been to the SaaS website, seen any of the SaaS stuff. She's uh, big time involved in that and also uh, the organizer of the Mixin, which is seriously the best SaaS meetup name. I was extremely <laughs> sad that I didn't think of that one first, so uh, great job with that. Um, so uh, before we jump into the interview, uh, there's a couple things we want to bring up. I actually have a, a lot of uh, fun news that's happening in the SaaS world right now. Uh, for one, if you've been living under a rock, uh, you might have missed the fact that SASConf is um, just put out its call for propo uh, for pro proposals. It's a tough word today. Um, uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> you should you should you should speak publicly, Micah. I should. That'd be good. Maybe a good practice. Um, it's going to be a little different this year, um, which is kind of going to be fun because it's going to be um, basically Git based, where where you go in and you create like a markdown file, you create an issue, a pull request. I'm trying to remember. I, I know I read issue. it. Just an issue. issue. <laughs> there we go. That's probably a lot easier than a pull request. So, yeah. um, uh, it's based off the um, JS Fest and CSS Comp Oakland. They did the same yep. thing, and, and I submitted to that. Really, really loved it. Uh, it was cool to see what other people had written, you know, what they had submitted, and uh, you could go back and edit and, like, add stuff, and, and I felt like I could talk a little bit more casually about my talk and have kind of a conversation about it rather than... You didn't like, have to have it perfect that first time. I submitted like, this abstract, like, it's yep. done, you know, and so so I'm, I'm really excited to do it that way and just, like, get... I, I think that one of the things I'm excited about is having attendees and other people, like, vote and be like, ooh, I, like, that's yep, cool, or, oh, you're question. gonna answer this question, or whatever. So. And it's actually important to say that you're actually going to be involved, if not leading, the selection process. I so am. That's, that's why you know so much about it. I should yes. have you say that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, we, we can tweet out the blog post. I tweeted it on the SASConf Twitter, but uh, Claudina and I had some conversations at SASConf last year, and I had been to a couple of other conferences over the summer and was kind of tweeting, like, What's the kind of event that I really want to go to? You know, what are the things I really care about? You know, what do I, what do I like and and not like? You know, as a speaker, but also as an attendee. Um, my uh, fiance Jeffrey came with me to a couple of conferences, and and we were having some conversations because he was like, I just fall asleep when I sit in the dark room for you know hours and hours. He's like, it's interesting stuff, but I, I don't get to uh, go and try it out or or have a good conversation about it. Um, so I had some conversations with Claudina, and um, she was concerned, you know, kind of about the the lack of diversity in submissions um, from last year. Uh, and so she asked me if I wanted to to be involved and kind of do the speaker selection. We had talked a lot about, like, doing the open CFP on GitHub and, like, what that would look like. And um, we will be, like, inviting some speakers as well as doing the CFP and doing a ton of, like, mentoring and speaker prep. And um, I'm working on getting some, like, CFP mentors right now, you know, people to kind of, like, bounce submissions off of and, and have, have that out there. So I'm super, super excited about the way that we're, we're doing it this year. Um, awesome. Need a little more hands-on, I think. Yeah, no, no doubt. And get, I like the idea of having mentors to kind of help you with that because a lot of people have ideas, but they don't know how to formulate it into a talk. So that's right. going to be really cool. And if you're, if for some reason, not if you're not familiar or familiar with GitHub and issues and how that works, it's basically mm -hmm. there's a Git repo. You just need an account, and you can click Make an Issue, and you just type out your submission and hit go, 
And the great thing about it is it allows you to go back and edit that over time, as well as people can comment uh, uh, on that issue um, when they have questions about it or want some clarification. Yeah, so. and there's a there's a whole template for the submission, so you can just kind of like copy that and fill it out, and um, you know, that's another reason I want to have the mentors. Will hopefully be get, getting that out pretty soon. So you know, if you like, I'm not really sure what to submit or how to submit it. They'll be there for that too, and. Um, yeah, awesome. should be, yeah, so sasconf.com, correct? Sasconf.com, yep. And Excellent. there's a whole, in the GitHub repo, there's a link on the sasconf Twitter as well as in the blog, um, but there's a whole thing about all the different types of submissions because we're doing more than just talks this year. So we're doing lightning talks and um, trying something out new with this moderated discussions thing. Uh, we'll kind of see how that goes. We've gotten already one submission that he said might be a moderated discussion, which is super exciting. So cool. um, lots of options. Like if you're not like, I want to stand up and give a talk, like, Lots of, of other ways, ways to get, to get involved. involved. Yeah, cool. and and I and I believe I won't speak for Claudina, but I believe that the the unconference day will be coming back as well. So for those of you who were there last year, they did uh, an unconference. So the the last day was just kind of a come as you are. Everybody can make your own little you know, fifteen twenty thirty minute talks or groups or workshops or whatever, and a huge success. So definitely. Um, trying to bring some of that into the regular conference as well as having that exist on its own. Cool. And SASConf is going to be in Austin. It this is going to be in Austin correct? this year. Is there an I'm exact so date excited. for it yet, or is it still just fall-ish? No, it's still fall. We're we're trying to. We were actually having a conversation about this about 15 minutes ago. We're trying to figure out what, how to schedule it and avoid like all the other things that are going on in September, October. Um, Stuff in Austin, like ACL and Formula One, but also other conferences. Um, there's a couple. There's some something in Barcelona, and then like a Drupal Con, like something in Europe, and then CSS DevConf. And yeah, it's, it's a busy month. <laughs> it's conference season. Yeah. Um, but we don't want to do it too early because we want to have enough time, you know, for speakers and everybody to prep, you know, up until the fall. Yeah. And we don't want to do it too late because then it gets into Thanksgiving. And so, um, for those of you who are asking for a date, we hear you. We're trying to figure it out as best as we can. It'll happen. We'll figure it out. All right. Well, uh, so uh, item number two, we'll try to get through these quick because I know Gina's over there going, hey, what about me? <laughs> Actually, you've got item number three. I'll let you do that one on there. Uh, but also, um, Camp SAS is coming up, which is a little one-day uh, single-track thing that Hampton puts on, uh, has put on. This is the second year from doing it. Uh, it's going to be April 4th uh, down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So he's gone completely other coast. Uh, which I was a little shocked by. I was like, oh, okay, it's slightly different. Um, I will be speaking at that. I think I'm going to do um, something on visual regression testing. So if you're curious about that and you want to get out and see that, it should be a fun talk. Um, and uh, you can come out and see me and say hi. So that's going on April 4th, uh, Camp SAS. You can check that out and get tickets right now. Um, and then the third one, uh, the Mixin, it looks like there's an event coming up on March 11th. Gina, do you want to tell us about that one? Yeah, uh, I, I did want to mention I'm, I'm also going to be speaking at Camp SAS, so oh, we'll awesome. get to hang That's out right. finally and Excellent. meet each other. It's going to be awesome. Um, yeah, so the Mixin I'm super excited about because we have uh, Tab Atkins, uh, who, you know, uh, CSS and HTML spec writer, works at Google, um, and also Cordelia McGee-Tub, who is a a uh, colleague of mine who is an accessibility specialist and a cartoonist. So I'm like super excited. And so if you're in San Francisco, please come out and hang out because I think it's going to be a lot of fun. That sounds like a blast. I, I, you guys should just move everything up to Portland. Just check out <laughs> and just move a couple hundred miles north. We'll be good to go. Um, and, and last one we just wanted to bring up, There's um, we love kind of bringing up some of the interesting like sassy drama going on. And not that it's a huge drama. It's kind of fun. We had Ben Frayn on last week. And he'd actually mentioned he was putting a blog post together about uh, about breaking up with SAS and, and moving from pre-processing to post-processing. Uh, none of that blog article came out this last week, and uh, and he was really apologetic. He's not trying to say that SAS is horrible, and you know it was kind of more him than SAS. And anyway, it was an interesting article of really more of the power of post-processors and the things that you can actually do now on the post side. And for some people that don't need a lot of SAS's capabilities, like they're not, they're not using large frameworks or grid frameworks or anything like that, a lot of that you can move to the end, like you know vendor prefixes. I mean, you could do variables. You could probably do a lot of stuff on that post side. Um, and we just didn't really have those tools to do when SAS first came out. Like Grunt allows us to do a lot of like the concatenation and, and be able to go through files and, and do some work on them. So um, really interesting. I don't want to jump into it because I have a lot talked about today. Uh, but also uh, James Steinbeck, um, 
uh, did a great follow-up piece on that. We'll make sure to tweet both of those out of why he's not breaking up with SaaS. And, and again, you know, it's everyone has tools and has uses and depends on the use case. And it's, it's really neat to at least see the discussions um, and, uh, and bring those topics up of, you know, how far can you go with post-processing? You know, is there a limit? Um, and those are always good things to, uh, to explore. So without further ado, Let's get past the news. We'll jump into the interview. Um, it's awesome to have Gina back. You've been on, I think, twice now. We had you in on uh, Women of SaaS quite a while ago, mm -hmm. and then we had you come in and talk about your um, uh, conference you're going to talk you're going to give at SaaS or SaaScon last year. So um, session. Yes, time that three. was actually with Elise. We yeah. did a workshop yep. together. <laughs> so, hey, it's the three of us back on the show yeah. once again. <laughs> I love it. So as we're diving into front-end architecture, what it is and, and how people are using it, um, um, and actually as, as I wrote down front-end architect, you said, or design system architect, uh, very similar types of roles. Uh, when did you first realize that you wanted to do more than just write the code, you're more interested in, in the systems that surrounded the code? Uh, yeah, so um, before I took on this role, um, I worked at a lot of startups and uh, design agencies. So I found myself, you know, building websites over and over and over again. And um, when you do that, you kind of start to develop these uh, patterns. And um, so that was like a small part of it. But I, I found when I was um, at Do.com, which was the startup that Salesforce used to own, um, which is how I ended up joining Salesforce. Um, I was always wanting to work on that type of stuff. Like we had an Android app, an iPhone app, um, the web app, and I wanted to try to align all the, the UI. And so uh, the part I was most passionate about is trying to figure out what that workflow would be, um, the style guide, um, how to spec design for all three platforms. Um, and I realized that I was getting more and more passionate and interested in that than I actually was in like designing and building out features. Not that I don't like doing that. I love designing and building features. I feel I, like you always have to make that disclaimer. I do it too. I'm like, it's not that that's yeah. not good. I just, yeah. <laughs> I don't like it. Exactly. Like I, I love product design as a whole. Um, I like the start. I like the finish. I like everything in between. But I find like when I get like really like, turn, you know, turning late night hours because I can't get it away from the computer, it's when I'm working on like this type of stuff. <laughs> And I think that's the amazing thing and what front-end architecture came out of was, you know, there's all these people that just do front-end development and, but they realize there's this one part of it they're really excited about and yeah. they just, they don't get a chance to do it enough and they always want to do more of it. They're always like looking and, and learning and searching sure. uh, and, and I, to put a name around it, to put like a, this is what we do, this is what we try to accomplish, to start codifying those. And that's exactly what this whole series has been about, of trying to find what front-end architecture is. And, and I can see design system architecture being kind of similar extension of that, but then also stretched to, to multiple flat, platforms, yeah. like you were doing. Right. And I feel like Gina was maybe one of the one of the first people to really start talking about it, like when you're talking about all your style guide stuff. Like you were talking about that before um, I think a lot of people were or kind of like right at the very, very beginning of it. Um, and I'm curious to see where it ends up distinguishing it, distinguishing itself um, like front-end architecture versus like the design system stuff um, is obviously very, very related, but um, certainly more on the like design side versus, you know, grunt and gulp and build tasks and stuff like that, which, yeah, a lot, difficult to untangle, but... Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times, it's two different teams. Like for most companies, design and dev are still two very separate groups, um, and so it would be cool to kind of like see some more of that structure happening on both sides for the same ultimate goal. So, Gina, you gave a talk here recently um, last week, I think, Cascade um, SF, and I, I know I saw the tweet about it and the, the topic, and looked at looked at the slide deck real quick, and like. I, I, Everyone should really just move up to Portland. It would be just so much better. <laughs> I'm really sad I missed it. It looked amazing. So what I wanted to do is kind of um, poke your mind a little bit about that talk. Um, I'll, I'll tweet out the um, the link for the speaker deck uh, certainly after the show so other people can take a look at it. But um, what was this talk about? I, I know one of the first things that, that kind of came up was, was red lines. And I know I've, I've come across uh, some of these docs as well. And, and as, as these systems get so, so large, 
these red lines can just turn into nightmares. So um, you want to tell us a little about that and just kind of get us going on what let's talk about was about? Sure, yeah. So I was talking about uh, living design systems, which is the, I guess, term that we're kind of using to describe everything that we're doing. Um, and so the gist of the talk and like kind of what the focus is of my team is um, so specking design, um, especially for enterprise software, is like really, really hard. And you know, it's always evolving, always changing, and there's so many different screens and UIs. And if you're doing redline specs, like you're basically in hell. <laughs> it's not fun. Um, and especially if you're trying to uh, spec those designs across multiple platforms and devices, um, it's not fun. Um, and so I think what has evolved, like style, style guides were sort of a way to get out of that and uh, focus more on designing systems. Um, and what I was talking about was like kind of taking it a, a step above that and creating an overall design system, which I think a lot of style guide tools and front end architecture tools are aiming to do this anyway. Um, so Can you give us a good definition of what is a red line and why is it so important? Yeah, okay, yeah, so red line is sort of a, I guess you could say like a word um, that people call design specs in which you might be marking like, okay, this padding is 16 pixels and this margin is 8 pixels and this type uh, typeface is this font and the sizing of the font or uh, the heading is like this this many pixels, like you're basically specking to detail so that developers that maybe don't have a good eye for design can just like follow the instructions, like paint by number, and just build it out exactly how you spec it. So it's basically like annotating the, the code that's on the page. Yeah, like you might, like a lot of times what people will do is they'll take their design comp and they'll just overlay red lines, like literally red lines on top of it. Uh, and mark out like the pixel dimensions and deliver a PDF, mm -hmm. um, which is not good. <laughs> so that's that's a good a good segue then of uh, you know said this is that it's you know it's, it could be a nightmare and so how is that a nightmare versus designing systems like so what's that transition yeah. is how does that how does that save us from the nightmare of red lines? Right. Uh, yeah. So red lines was something that was very much part of the workflow here and some designers here still do them. It's you know it's hard to break old habits. Um, and we wanted to basically have longevity over our designs and consistency and um, avoid like all the, the UI bugs that could come out um, from like you know one designer might spec one thing and another designer might be opinionated in a different way and spec it a different way and so we wanted to avoid that. Um, so a, a portion of our system that we're working on, um, we um, have this idea of what's called like design properties. So it's basically if you think about SAS variables, it's like that. It's like colors, type sizes, uh, spacing, um, anything that is basically the value. Uh, we catalog those as um, what sometimes we call them tokens or we call them design properties. And then um, we basically tell our designers that if you're going to do a red line spec, don't put pixel values in your spec. Put the name of the token in your spec, because then if the design gets updated, um, that's okay. Like your your spec is still accurate. Gotcha. Um, so you have some set values, like you know, 20 pixels is our gutter. So instead of saying 20 right. pixels, say gutter value or whatever the case is. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that um, that was a part of it, and we had some developers, you know, understanding like, okay, so you have this SAS variable, but I don't use SAS, so how, how can I use that? Um, so we built this tool called Theo, which is open source, and we're super excited about it. And basically what it does is um, uh, we maintain a JSON file that has like name and value pairs, and they're all categorized towards like whether they're background color, or foreground color, spacing, um, whatever it is, border radius, whatever. Um, we catalog all that in a JSON file, and then Theo basically generates SAS slash stylus, XML, uh, JSON, and uh, Aura, which is our internal uh, framework system that we use at Salesforce. Um, so basically it's agnostic, and uh, we can 
basically create the file for you of like whatever the variables or tokens are that you need, and then you just um, build, apply that into your build system. So every time you build, you pull in the new design system. Nice. So yeah, I know a lot of people kind of talked about this of of taking like if we could only get to the variables inside of SAS, you know, with with somewhere else in our system, whether it's for JavaScript mm -hmm. or HTML or something like that. Um, and a lot of the ways to do that is to pull those values out into JSON, mm -hmm. so those are accessible to so many different platforms. And then there just needs to be some way that that uh, that SAS can ingest that JSON. And I've, I've, I know I've seen several like SAS to JSON. I think is one of them. Mm -hmm. A bunch of different ways to do that. So um, yeah, yeah just taking the abstraction up one one layer allows you to to get those variables everywhere. Yeah, we went back and forth on where like were we going to abstract out of SAS or abstract out of JSON, and we just found that for like all the automation that we need to build around it, it was easier for us to actually do it in JSON and then extract the SAS we needed out of that. Yeah, that makes um, a lot of sense because everything can read JSON. It's really easy mm -hmm. to parse. And obviously your build system is going to be able to just suck it right in and use it pretty easily. Yeah, um, and so it's really awesome because um, it used to take a really long time to make design changes across a really large application. and um, you know, if like let's say a color is no longer um, needing to be used because maybe it's failing contrast ratios for accessibility, um, we don't have to notify like 30 different development teams to make that change. Like we just change it on our end, and then when they pull in the new, you know, system, then they have it, which is awesome. <laughs> how, how are you doing that setup of having them like pull in changes? Are you kind I was of like just going to ask the same versioning? question? Uh, are you are you doing kind of versions? Are you updating them? Are you informing them when you update? Like, how are you right. kind of running that process? Yeah, so it's versioned. So um, for each release of our product, we have sort of a snapshot of like this is you know this like this version as of this date. Like when we released, this was the variable set, and you can pull from that. If you're actually working ahead of other teams, which sometimes happen, like maybe you're a prototyping team, you can pull in a newer snapshot, which is like knowing that it's like work in progress, that the design systems team, which I'm on, is currently updating it. Um, so you can kind of pick like which of those versions like you should be working with. Nice. And so we you're have pulling those in like with Bower or with some other tool? Um, so this is where I say design systems and front end architecture go hand in hand. I have a counterpart <laughs> that I work with. Um, yeah, so I I, I want to say he's using so we're using Gulp, we're using Node, obviously, um, and yeah. So I think I think it's it's something in there. <laughs> yeah, if, I, if I'm like not, the, if it's not Bauer, I mean, it's probably in PM, and that's kind of what we're planning yeah. to do. I think um, it's mostly that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's some it's kind of dependency easy. manager is pulling yeah. that new file in. That's what it comes. Oh, to. oh, dependency manager. Okay, so <laughs> um, actually, um, we were doing. Um, I can't remember what we were using before to do it, but uh, we ended up sort of creating our own dependency manager, which is literally just pulling in a GitHub repo. And um, the reason I think we needed to do that is like we're um, we're using the enterprise version. Of the enterprise version of GitHub, which is, you know, it requires VPN access and all this stuff. So it was, like, kind of difficult to pull things out of there into there, and so we just sort of say, okay, look at this GitHub repo. And, and pull down a particular tag or yeah, branch pull, or something. Pull down the, yeah, pull down that tag, and then um, it's Git ignored, so if you make a change in there, it's not going to affect what you're doing, but then you can actually kind of... Uh, CD into that folder, and it's just a, basically a clone of that repo, so you can like push it up from there. Yeah, um, we're we're doing that, but with npm. That's kind of our yeah. plan. It's basically the same same kind of setup. Like yeah. this is the folder of all the stuff you can go and edit it, but it's in your main project, but it's getting ignored. So like if you edit it there, right. it won't screw everything up. Yeah, it won't get back in. Yep. And then each project can pull down a different version. Yeah, we do same thing with Bower. It just mm -hmm. it goes and grabs a Git repo, pulls it in. And then you can change yeah. which keep root over you're pulling in. You can be on the bleeding edge, or you can be, you know, version behind, mm -hmm. unstable. So I yeah, think it's, the, it's really the thing that I'm struggling with stuff. is the versions. Like, how do you version it? How do you message that? And and what's the process right. of updating? And like, I, we're so, just approaching this right now, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm really trying to figure out how to do it. 
So we have one branch, or not branch, sorry, we have a repo um, called S1 Variables. S1 stands for Salesforce One Variables. And it's sort of um, the single source of truth of all our design properties. Um, in other words, tokens or variables or whatever you want to look at them as, <laughs> depending on which world you live in. Um, so there, each branch is that version. So maybe there's like version, you know, whatever last season's release was, whatever the name of that branch is according to that version. And then maybe you're working on a more current version. Um, it's going to be another branch. And then our style guide internally, which um, um, so we have sort of an internal version that's like everybody um, who has VPN access can access. And we have our style guide um, pull in like different versions of those tokens based on the URL string. Um, so like if you're looking for this release's set of design properties, you click on that one. If you're looking for last uh, versions, then you click on that one. If you're looking for like the work in progress, like latest and greatest, you can click on that one. And the style guide just sort of reshapes itself depending on which set that you're pulling in. Um, as well as like if you're building a prototype or whatever and you're pulling in a certain uh, branch, um, your prototype will then look the way it's supposed to look depending on which branch you're pulling in. Yeah, and I think that's the cool thing about this single source of truth. I think Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really didn't do much documentation before in these last couple of years when and this was still a bit more of the norm, but like back in the day, you you create the documentation very much out of thin air. You basically just build it on its own, uh, you know, setting everything up and writing all of the code or whatever you need to build it. But now we're moving to a point where our style guides are ingesting the exact same uh, styles, the exact, exact same variables or whatever the case is mm -hmm. as the production site. And this mm -hmm. allows you to do exactly what you're doing, is, is switching from one branch to another and right. you'll switch from you know, variables from you know, whatever last release to the variables of this release and your style guide changes right along with that. So your documentation follows completely along with, with all of your, with the code you're actually using. And yeah. it's a, it's a and powerful course, relationship. And of course that documentation is generated, so if we've added six new variables, if you click through to an older version, you're not going to see those. But if yep. you click through a newer version, they're, they're there. It's so. really kind of fun. So that single source of truth, that's kind of what you're talking about, right? Where mm -hmm. you have this one Git repo where everything's coming from. You can make a change in one place, and all of that's distributed down. Um, exactly. That's it's a pretty awesome design system. It, it's it's Thanks. neat to be working <laughs> in that <good> environment. <laughs> I have a really, really smart team that is a combination of designers and front-end people. So I feel like it's like, this combo front end architecture and design systems conglomerate. <laughs> That's kind of how we feel too. It's just like when you get to this point, it's almost magical of like yeah. we've never gotten a project to this like this this level before. Like we've just leveled yeah. it up to this point where it's like, wow, we're doing things we've never been able to do before because we've been able to, you know, kind of um, <clears throat> you know usher it in or just um, shepherd it in uh, to that point. So it's a whole lot of fun. Um, and I know one thing that you said uh, that's really important, I know we were just talking about this today actually internally, was about uh, with these style guides of documentation and the documentation process of making making documentation part of your workflow. Mm -hmm. So is, was that a big cultural shift for you guys to, to do over there? Uh, well, I think it, it's sort of something that affects everywhere I've worked, not just here. Like a lot of people kind of wait until the end. And it's sort of the same with like, you know, refactoring or, or realigning stuff. Um, people just kind of look at it as busy work and they do it at the end. And then chances are you're really not going to do it because other things get prioritized. And then your style guide or your um, uh, documentation piece gets out of date and then it's no longer accurate. Um, so it is really important to make it part of that workflow. So, like, um, we're fortunate that we have a team focused on this and dedicated to this. So as we're, you know, designing out a new, um, maybe it's like a refresh of the, the UI, um, that's part of our workflow. Like we document it. I mean, we have to so devs can use it and designers can use it in their specs if they choose to use that. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, until that's been done, like we, we can't ship that. Um, yep. And it just makes things uh, have a lot better clarity um, 
so there's that human element to it, but it also helps the overall app quality. So um, I think it's important to make it part of your process. So if you have like a workflow where it's like, oh, you must do a pull request, and then somebody has to review it, and then maybe you put it in beta, and then you test it for a while. Like as whatever that workflow is that you have when you release, like add something in there about like, and make sure as you're building it, you're documenting it. Like in the story, there needs to be a task that says yeah. write the documentation. And then you yeah. put a, a number of hours next to that. And you're like, <laughs> I have work to do to document. Um, yeah. and, and the nice thing about creating those tasks is now you have the, the opportunity to do that. Um, I know mm -hmm. oftentimes they're like, you know, just get it done. We don't want you to like spend time on documentation. Just yeah. do it. So I if you give yourself time, it's great. The word documentation, I think, is kind of scary for people because it's like, oh, so much writing. But really, like, just, like, even if it's just like a sentence, like it doesn't have to be like this massive essay. And it's, and it's only a hassle when you have to go back later and figure out what you did and write it down. Like if, yeah. you, if you write that out, like as soon as you're writing the code and you know what it is, it comes very, very naturally, at least to me, to just be like, yeah. oh, and this is what I did. I wrote this code and then I wrote what I did. And mm -hmm. if like two weeks later, I'm just like, I don't, I don't know, it works. <laughs> Whatever, I don't care. So I don't want to write about it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how has this been for you? You've, you've talked about your you're writing this for not just the UX um, team, but also for the engineering team. So you have this one document, you have this one style guide that that everyone's able to collaborate on. Um, how, how has that process been? Uh, what kind of wins have you gotten from that? Uh, yeah. So I guess like our team is the one that's usually creating these. Variables, so we're also the one that should be um, talking about like how to use them, where to use them, um, and as long as I mean, we try to make the name declarative enough that you know what it's for, but sometimes even that's not enough, and so um, you know we'll have to uh, say like this is used for this component, um, for this piece of that component. Um, the more descriptive we are, the better, and so we find like it's better to take the time to do it then than to like answer like comment after comment on a ticket of like no, you're using the wrong one. You're supposed to be using this other one. It's like if you can avoid all that just by like being super super clear from the beginning, you're gonna you know have a much better time. <laughs> Yeah. You're not going to have a bad time. So, <laughs> so you're actually you're creating documentation, you're creating a system that you are handing off to your engineers to implement, right? So this uh, is these, so these this ones, is this, the, like the this is the blueprints for for what they're actually creating. Yeah. So this has been an evolving workflow. So um, in the last couple releases, I think what we saw a lot of is uh, some designers still doing red lines, but then running the red lines by us so we can make sure that they're using the correct tokens. Um, and then that gets delivered. Um, we're currently wa working on an update to our style guide that will actually sort of serve as the red line, like the single source of truth we were talking about. Because um, even when you have designers pointing to tokens and their specs, it's there's still that chance that maybe they're pointing to the wrong one. Um, or, you know, they they might be pointing to one that's been deprecated for some, whatever reason. Um, so we kind of want to have like a central place that people can look at. Um, so you know, a lot of style guides include UI libraries. Um, so of course, you know, we're working on that too, a component library. But we're actually going to be um, what we're working on is uh, showing what the spec is. Um, within that documentation. So like here's the tokens that were used and here's what we did on the SAS side, here's what you're going to be doing on the Aura side and, and um, we're even looking at tokenizing UI copies so we can standardize on that as well. And so lots of exciting stuff and we're, we're stoked to have that become like our spec. And it's so much fun that this is this is exciting. These are, are the things that, that drive us and yeah. get us out of bed in the morning so that we can we can create these systems. And mm -hmm. I really think that's kind of the amazing thing is um, you know, we're able to build things we weren't able to build a couple of years ago. And and mm -hmm. the work that we're doing is influencing the work that people are gonna be doing in you know in the future as these things just become standard practice. Right. So I think one of the big things we see the changes in <clears throat> is that we now have UX that is leading development. As opposed to develop, or as opposed to UX and, and especially front end architecture, this is kind of the big pain point. Is is like it was always here. Here's this pretty design. Okay, developers build this thing. 
okay, front end people make it look pretty, you know, put the whiz bang on it. And to be able to flip that around so that we're actually having having UX and have that development process before implementation um, just creates a real powerful place for us to work in. We're able to build things quick, we're able to build systems rather than just constantly patching and trying to make things work. So um, I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, there's people out there fighting that, that good fight to do this. So um, I know I've had a chance to tweet out um, your speaker deck as well as link to Theo. <clears throat> so for people that um, have caught those, those are out there open source and visible and can poke at them. And I definitely want to check Theo out because that's um, uh, really neat. I'm, I'm curious how that kind of whole thing comes together because we still have everything in SAS because we're really just dealing with the website. But um, we'd really love to see how that would, would pull out to, to be um, useful for other systems. So um, what other stuff, um, uh, I, I know you're involved in lots of stuff over there, not just the Theo system and everything, but what else are you working on that's kind of exciting and, and upcoming uh, for you right now, Gina? Uh, specifically at Salesforce or just in life? <laughs> life in general, open question. Uh, well, I, I'm trying to get involved with some events and stuff, so I'm actually going to be helping out a little bit with swag for SASCOF. So I'm super excited about that. Um, I've always kind of wanted to... She's got some good ideas, and I'm pretty stoked. Yeah, I've always wanted to um, organize a conference of my own, and I feel like this is sort of like helping me get my feet a little wet. Um, and I... Let me see, what else? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I guess like I'm, I'm getting a little more involved with some of the... Um, I, I'm not sure what the right word is to use for this, but like um, helping out with like events and like outreach like here uh, on my team. And so I feel like in a way I'm kind of doing a little bit of evangelism, so that's kind of fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, just lots of events. Like um, I'm trying to offer like my help to events because I want to get that practice. And um, I have this idea for a conference that I want to throw, and um, I want it to be amazing, obviously. So I feel like as much practice as I can get in doing these meetups and helping out with conferences, then um, I'll be a little bit better off when I do the. Can you give us a, a hint as to what this um, conference is going to be, or is it? Um, it's going to be related to what we're talking about, <laughs> but um, a, a particular piece of it. So let's let's leave it at that for right now because right. I don't want to make a promise and not deliver on it. So um, yeah. <laughs> Well, won't we'll hold you to it then. Yeah. Um, but uh, but speaking of events and conferences and whatnot, do you have um, upcoming speaking engagements? Well, obviously, Camp SAS. I'll see you there. Yeah. Um, um, what else are you up to? I'm going to be at Squares, which I'm excited. I think Una and Mina are going to be there. I'm not sure if um, either of you are going to be there. I hope so. Um, it's in Texas. Um, it's in Grapevine, Texas. <laughs> um, so that's next month. And... Um, I think I might Do you have any idea how far away from Austin that is? I have no idea. I don't know anything about Texas. Google. Um, <laughs> yeah. Google. It's I like it's four hours. It's closer to Dallas. So. It's, um, yeah. It's, yeah. it's way a ways away, so I don't think I'll be there. But. Aww. <laughs> okay. Um, and yeah, CSS DevConf. Um, and um, there's been a couple that have asked, and I... Uh, accepted, but they haven't announced yet, so I don't want to name them until they make the announcement. I think it's you know kind of rude to do that when. Yeah, it, understandable. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I, I think that that's all I can think of at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like I'll be seeing at CSS DevConf then again this year. Um, oh, cool! And which amazing segue into um, our spe our guest next week is going to be Kevin Lambing. Um, who has done a lot of work in visual regression testing. So we bumped heads a little while ago. I don't even know how this kind of thing came about. I think he did a conference, and I was like, oh, that's... Or he did a workshop at another conference, and I was like, oh, that's really cool. We should do a workshop together sometime. And they were like, hey, we should do a workshop at CSS DevConf. And so, lo and behold, uh, we put a proposal together, and we're going to do a workshop at CSS DevConf. It's so, funny how that works. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, so Kevin and I are going to start planning that. We've got some really... Um, some, some, we're scheming. It's, it should be a whole lot of fun. Uh, what we'll be doing, it'll be you know, a full day workshop on, um, on visual regression testing using various numbers of tools. Um, 
you know, working it, getting it into your workflow, getting into code, um, just doing it. So it's going to be a ton of fun. You can you can actually go to um, CSS DevConf and sign up for that now. Um, if you haven't done the workshops there, there are additional costs on top of the rest of the conference. Uh, but hopefully, you can find a good employer that will love for you to come back with some amazing uh, visual regression knowledge. So um, that's always the hope. So yes, next week Kevin Lamping will be in, and it's actually completely coincidental. He just happened to be scheduled for this upcoming week. Um, I think we did that actually before the, the uh, CSS DevConf came around. Um, but anyway, enough of that. Um, Gina, awesome to talk to you again. It's going to be exciting Tim. to see you in just a month or so, right? Yeah. A month. Okay, yeah, I'd better start planning my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Four weeks, plenty of time. So um, it's great for you to come on. I'm really excited to hear you. Um, are you gonna be, do you know what you're going to be speaking on at uh, Camp SAS? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm getting kicked out of the room. Oh, but, yes. um, yeah, I, I'm going to be probably talking about design systems. So. And I am excited <laughs> to hear about it. So um, thank you for coming on. Thank you for everyone who is letting you be in that room for another five seconds. And uh, <laughs> thanks for the listeners for coming on. Uh, we will see you next week on SAS Fights. Thanks. Right. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Bye.